Hey everybody! Well, this will be the third and final video covering the Lost in Space bloopers, trivia, and oddities, things that went on to, in the show. So the third season was their final season, and once again we see some more changes that happen, and I think they're for the better. We get a more interesting uh, theme song at the beginning, they have a more interesting intro as well. They get new uniforms or new uh, clothes, new costumes. And they finally get to leave that planet, which is nice. They do a lot more space traveling in the third season, which I think makes it a lot more interesting. So, and the third season is actually my favorite. So, all right, well, let's start with episode one and see what we can find. So the first episode is called Condemned of Space, and they finally take off from this planet. And it's interesting because rather than spend all this money doing more special effects, they actually just took the original footage of the Jupiter 2 crashing down on the planet and they just ran it in reverse. And in a, actually, it was a smart move to do it that way. Also, the fact that uh, Irwin Allen was smart enough to film this stuff in color because, you know, the original first season was black and white. So it was good that he did it in color so that they could actually use it for this kind of thing. But the dead giveaway here is if you watch that smoke, you will see it actually going backwards. See how it's going in? It's going back down to the ground. So that's the only thing that doesn't quite work with that footage, but you can actually see that they ran it in reverse. Now, this episode features the first appearance of the stunt robot. They actually made a stunt version of the robot, mainly for this segment. So originally, they were, the robot gets sucked into space because of a, a mistake that Dr. Smith makes. And so originally, they were going to use the uh, actual costume and suspend it with wires, but the costume is way too heavy. And if you put Bob, uh, Bob May in there, the man who was inside the robot, it makes it even more heavy. So they actually constructed another robot, but this one was much more cheaper uh, built. It was just made of wood, um, some very lightweight materials, foam. I think the brain was just cardboard and they actually just used black uh, marks a lot to draw in the little patterns. <laughs> and so it's pretty cool. And it'll show up several times throughout the third season. Also of note, uh, this episode is the episode that was used for the Viewmasters. The, those of you old enough to remember the Viewmasters toys, I had one when I was a kid. Um, for those of you not familiar, it was these little discs of film that you could put in this viewer. And then when you look through it, it turns the images three-dimensional. And then you flip down this little uh, lever on the side and, it, and you can go through the whole story and uh, see everything in 3D. It's pretty cool. I still have my original Viewmasters, all three discs. I still have the booklet that came with it and the package it came in, so huh, I still kept all of that stuff. So the Jupiter 2 ends up landing on this space station, and it turns out that it's actually a prison, and all the prisoners are actually frozen, so they stay frozen until their sentence is over. So as Will, Dr. Smith, and the robot go into the space station looking for John and Don, Will walks over to uh, this, this door, and if you look, now start watching this window right over here, there's a guard, well, let me fast, let me uh, move it up just a bit. Right there. Okay, now keep an eye on the uh, prisoner's hand right there. He's holding that little weapon. You'll see him actually move his hand. It's like he's getting a better grip on it. See right there? <laughs> so obviously the guy who's portraying that prisoner didn't know he was on camera. So yeah, you can actually see him move even though he's supposed to be frozen. Now in this scene, all the prisoners are making their daring escape by knocking the clocks off the pedestals that kept them frozen. Now if you watch the, uh, the actor back here, he's coming out of his frozen stupor right here. You can kind of see him waving back and forth. And then we get a close-up of Marcel Hilaire, and now you can see he's back to being frozen again. And now he's kind of coming to again here. See how he's coming to again? And then in the next scene, as we see Marcel Hilaire running, he's once again, here he is, he's frozen again, and for the third time he's now coming too. <laughs> so they totally screwed up there. They, um, I think they, it, you, I mean, you can clearly tell that they had to do that scene three times to get the close-ups and stuff, but that poor guy had to keep doing that three times. It's pretty funny. This episode is called Visit to a Hostile Planet. I absolutely love this episode. The Jupiter 2 ends up in a time warp, that sends them back to Earth, but it's Earth of 1947. And so when they land here, uh, they end up landing in a small town. And uh, the people that live there think they're some kind of space aliens called Voltones. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. But here we see, uh, for the first time, the full-size Jupiter 2 mock-up. They actually built this huge uh, Jupiter 2. Unfortunately, 
I think it was only used for two episodes. I think they only used it for two episodes of the entire series. And then after that, it sat for years on the back lot, um, and it just eventually rotted away in the weather. It's really sad. There's some footage uh, that Roddy McDowell from Planet of the Apes took. He used to take a lot of home movies, and when he was filming Planet of the Apes, um, Roddy McDowell was filming uh, from a helicopter that he took off from the 20th Century Fox lot to go to the beach where they filmed the uh, famous beach scene from the Planet of the Apes. But if you watch that footage, you'll be able to see this Jupiter 2 sitting down there on the ground uh, on the 20th Century Fox lot. So they were filming that at about the same time they filmed this. It was kind of an interesting little thing. Now, in this scene, Dr. Smith and Will go out looking around and investigating, and they bump into these two guys, and they almost have them convinced that they're not Voltones until the robot shows up, and then <laughs> they can't believe their eyes. And so this guy gets all trigger-happy, and he ends up shooting the robot. And when he does shoot the robot, he leaves this mark right here. You can see this big old gouge on the side of the robot there. But in the very next scene, when the robot turns around and they start running from these guys, you can see that the mark is clearly gone. So somebody screwed up there. In this scene, we see Dr. Smith and John talking, and Dr. Smith is trying to convince the crew of the Jupiter 2 to stay on Earth. Now, if you notice the background, look how weird it is. You got these big black pieces of uh, plastic back there and lumber, and you can tell it's just obviously placed there, but that's because they actually they actually did film this outside, which was unusual for this episode. And um, so they filmed it on the studio back lot, uh, mainly where the main offices and stuff are. And so they had to cover up the signage and stuff back there. <laughs> and they just used this kind of rinky-dink way of covering it up. Once again, we see Bob May, the actor inside the robot, using that trick that he used in the first season, where he actually has to lean back. You notice how far he's leaning back? So he has to undo the ropes on um, Will's wrist. So you can tell that he's looking down from here straight down into that front vent. And that's how he can see what he's doing because he actually does untie Will's ropes. Now this episode is called Kidnapped in Space. And once again, this door that's on the upper level of the Jupiter 2 is converted into something else. We have seen this room turn into uh, a weapons locker or a storage room and now suddenly in season three it becomes the access point to the space pod and without any explanation whatsoever we get this new vehicle that looks a lot like the uh, lunar lander that landed on uh, the moon at around this time so you can tell it was influenced by that but we have this brand new vehicle and there was no explanation as to where it came from or how they got it or why they didn't use it in the previous two seasons and also, uh, you kind of wonder just how much room this ship has. I mean, how do they all, all of a sudden have this big, huge section of the ship to store that thing in? On the back of the space pod, you'll notice these serial numbers right here. Now, most Lost in Space fans know the significance of this. But what this is, is that was actually the phone number to uh, 20th Century Fox. And then the IA stands for Irwin Allen. That was his initials. So it's pretty funny how they put that in there as an Easter egg. This episode is called The Space Primevals, and the only blooper that I can remember seeing in this one is, once again, you can kind of see uh, right down here, Bob May is in the Bermuda shorts, as he liked to call it. That's when he they would take the tread section off, and he could actually walk around in the robot costume, giving him more freedom to move. And as he steps up onto this platform, you can see where the rubber of the legs end right there, and you can actually see his pant leg right there. And then... As he takes a few more steps, I wish I could get that. You can kind of see it right there. See how you can see his leg? It's pretty cool. And here I tried to freeze frame it, and you can actually see Bob May's uh, pant leg right there. I think he wore green uh, pants. I think he wore like a, a one-piece suit underneath all of that stuff. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. You can actually see his leg once again. This episode now is called The Space Destructors, and this is the one where Smith discovers this device in this cave where he makes just a whole bunch of duplicates of himself and then will even gets turned into dr smith too which is pretty crazy but now once again you know this show tends to use whatever it can find to use for background pieces and set dressing and if you look right uh here this right here that's the robot's arm molds so here i zoomed in on it but you can clearly tell that these are the molds that they use to make the robot's arms you can see all the ridges on there so it's pretty cool they even use things like that for set dressing. This episode features the second appearance of the stunt robot, and you can clearly tell because look at the back. It is so wrinkled. It's almost like his back is made of like a, 
cardboard or something. It's really weird, and it seems like it has different appearances when you see it in different shows and episodes, but in this scene, uh, this creature throws the robot down, and that's why they had to use the stunt version of him. This episode features Bill Mooney having to get a lot of makeup done on his face to look like Dr. Smith. And I, this is probably what started his disdain for having heavy makeup done. And uh, he would refuse some roles if it required him to have a lot of heavy makeup. But in this uh, scene right here, now you can see this big long tube. Now, as I mentioned in the season two video, Erwin Allen discovered where they were um, storing all the props and set pieces for the movie Fantastic Voyage. That was the movie where they shrank these scientists and they traveled around in this space age submarine in this man's body. And so you can see here, this is like a big old like vein or something like that. And this was used in Fantastic Voyage, but they found it in storage and thought, hey, let's go ahead and use it as a, a set piece. So once again, uh, a money saving way of adding cool looking uh, features to a set. Because this episode featured a whole bunch of Dr. Smiths in it, they ended up making a whole bunch of these masks for other actors to wear so that they would, you know, represent the uh, army of Dr. Smiths. And so uh, at the end of the filming of this episode, uh, Jonathan Harris was given one of these masks and he kept it for years. He said he kept it for years and it was in a case, um, a display case by his front door. But over the years, sadly, because they were made of latex, it eventually dried out and crumbled apart. So he didn't unfortunately get to keep it. But uh, it's kind of cool. Just think how much one of those things would be worth today. This episode is called The Haunted Lighthouse. And the Jupiter 2 lands on a space station. And when John disembarks the ship to go check it out, there's a voice that comes over and it's saying that the Jupiter 2 launched on September 18th, 1997. But it actually got the date wrong. If you watch the pilot, they actually launched on October 16th. Moving on now to this episode, which is titled Flight Into the Future. I really love this episode because it has kind of a weird feel to it and a lot of weird things happen in it. But now at the beginning of this episode, if you watch the light bulb in the robots bubble right up here near the top, it kind of starts going haywire. So here, I'll show you real quick. Now watch it. See how it starts? See how it just starts blinking like crazy right there? And I don't know why it does that. It's just kind of weird. It doesn't do it before this scene and it doesn't do it after. It just kind of goes crazy in that one particular scene. This episode is also unique because we get to see both robots in the same scene. So the robot that's the statue, that is actually the stunt robot that we saw. They just made him look like stone. The only time we get to see this again is in a future episode called The Antimatter Man, where we will see both robots in the same scene once again. But it's really cool. Now, this episode is called Collision of Planets, and I really like this episode because they really let Jonathan Harris ham it up in this episode. So uh, he ends up breathing in this green gas, and it turns him into this super strong version of himself, and he gets the, this sour apple green hair, and, and it's, just, it's just hilarious. But um, also, he gets to yell. You know, every time he talks, his, his voice is amplified, and it just has a lot of funny moments in it. In this scene, we see the stunt robot used once again when Dr. Smith picks up the robot to get him out of his way. But uh, he looks a little bit better here, the stunt robot does, but you can still tell he's looking a little rough. For whatever reason, the torso area here is very uh, bent up. And also, uh, I mean, you can't really tell, but, well, because if you look up here on the brain, I've seen pictures of uh, when they found the brain in a storage unit, it belonged to Greg Jean. And somebody took a good close-up picture of that brain, and it's actually just cardboard. And as I mentioned earlier, they just took a black Sharpie marker and drew in all those little, um, those little uh, what do you call it, like hieroglyphic kind of marks in there. And then these things are just clear tubes, kind of like what they use in fish tanks right there. So in this scene, Dr. Smith is tied up or chained to those uh, pillars. But when he raises his arms, Jonathan Harris accidentally breaks the chains before he's supposed to. So you can see the uh, chain right here on his arm. So watch when he raises his arm, he accidentally breaks that chain too soon, right there. And then a couple seconds later, he acts like he breaks the chains right there, but they were already broken. <laughs> now in this episode titled Space Creature, Will goes down to the third level of the Jupiter 2, the power core. 
So once again, things just don't make sense when it comes to the proportions of this ship. Uh, you know, uh, and things just are not explained. They just kind of happen. So how is there enough room in the Jupiter 2 to have this third level, the power core? Especially, look how tall this room is. And if you look at the model of the ship, you know, the, the structure of it, it barely has room for the two levels that it has. Now, mysteriously, we have a third level here, which is really tall. And, you know, same with the space pod. You know, where did that come from? So <laughs> just a lot of things that they do in the show that really aren't explained. This episode is called Day at the Zoo. And I don't know, quite frankly, it's not one of my favorite episodes. But uh, anyway, during this scene where Don is about ready to shoot this dragon, you can see how it looks. It was, it was a puppet. It was like a special effects puppet. But in the following scene, when Don shoots the dragon, you can see it's a totally different thing. In fact, this is actually a real lizard, and they added a bunch of um, horns to him. You can see right there. And so it's a totally different thing. It's weird how they used two different pieces of footage for the same monster. This episode is called Two Weeks in Space, and I would say it's another clunker of an episode from Season 3. But here, once again, in a cost-saving measure, they reuse stock footage for special effects. So now they come upon this space station, but it's actually the same space station that we saw before, but they just simply turned everything upside down. It's pretty hilarious. One thing I should mention is that Jonathan Harris was always really good at looking at the robot up to his bubble, because that's where his, his face actually is, if, if the robot has a face. But up here, uh, if you look at his bubble, you can see that light right there, and that light right there. Those are, That's the robot's eyes right there. Oftentimes when you look at the other actors, they're actually looking at the robot right here. That's because that's where Bob May would actually see out. He would see out between the slats of the collar. And so I kind of think they just kind of would forget sometimes. You know, they're, they think they're talking to Bob, but they're actually supposed to be talking to the robot. And they should be looking up at his bubble like Dr. Smith does. So Jonathan Harris was really good about that. Now, when Dr. Smith gets transformed into this creature, you can clearly tell that it's not Jonathan Harris that's under all that makeup. So I kind of find it interesting. I wonder if Jonathan Harris just refused to have all that makeup done on his face or for whatever reason, he just decided that he didn't want to do that part. But you can tell that whenever he speaks, uh, Jonathan Harris dubbed over the voice of whoever this actor actually is. This episode is called Castles in Space. And um, there's a funny scene where the robot gets drunk. And uh, here in this scene, he's suffering from a hangover. So they, it's amazing they have this large size um, ice pack to put on his bubble, which is pretty hilarious. Another thing to note about this episode is that Guy Williams and June Lockhart are not in this episode, which means that this episode was probably filmed after the Great Vegetable Rebellion, and there's a reason why Guy Williams and June Lockhart aren't in this episode, and I'll discuss that more when we get to that episode. Now, this episode is the Anti-Matter Man, and it is arguably probably one of the best episodes of the entire series and probably the odds-on favorite episode of most Lost in Space fans. Now, if you have the Blu-ray, you have got to listen to the commentary on a lot of these episodes, because it's really great. They have commentary from Mark Goddard, Marta Kristen, Angela Cartwright, and Bill Moomy, and they talk about these episodes and their recollections. But <laughs> this episode, they just start cracking up about this set piece, uh, particularly about the shape of these pieces right here. And... <laughs> They start laughing about it, and and I mean, for obvious reasons, but you, you have to hear their commentary. It is the most funniest thing that you'll hear on this entire thing. Now, once again, as we saw in the second season, um, this is not the best angle that they should be using for the camera when it comes to this particular set, especially whenever the lightning charges go off, because once again, here in the background, we can see how the mountains are just cardboard cutouts. You can see how they're actually very, they're just flat. They're just flat things. And it, you, they have this hill that kind of comes up to them, kind of maybe, uh, kind of using maybe like a forced perspective kind of look, at least from the ground view of it. But when they go high up like this, it's a dead giveaway on <laughs> how that really looks. But I do love it. I mean, there's there's a certain charm about this show and a lot of shows that had budgets like this. And, you know, I mean, you got to remember this is the 1960s. And so I, this kind of stuff would, you know, never fly today. But I, as a kid, and since this show was mostly made for kids, we never noticed it. But, you know, nowadays we have these wonderful uh, Blu-rays and, 
and stuff like that to be able to study every detail and pause and notice stuff that we never noticed before. <laughs> but I do love the fact that you can actually see how those mountains are actually just cardboard. Once again, in this episode, we very, very briefly get to see uh, Bob May's foot. Now you'll see it if you look down here, and I'll do this in slow motion, you will very briefly see right down here, Bob May's foot kind of poke out from behind there. Let me see if I can speed it up just a little bit. So right there, you can just very, very briefly see it. And here I zoomed in on it so we can see it a little bit better. So look right in this section right here and see right there. Oh, I got it paused perfect. You can actually see the tip of his foot right there. I mean, it's, you know, if you're not looking for it, you're not going to notice it. In this scene, uh, Will Robinson and the robot just entered the antimatter world. But if you watch the way that Will is walking right there, you can clearly tell that that is not Bill Mooney. In fact, it almost looks like it's a girl because you can actually see a little bit of breast action going on there. And so if you listen to the, uh, the commentary, Bill Mooney talks about this. And that's because by the time they filmed this, it was getting late in the day. And because he was a child actor, he was only allowed to work so many days uh, or so many hours per day. And so uh, by this time, they, they had lost him. They, they couldn't use him. And so they had his stand-in or his stunt person who was a girl. I can't remember her name. Um, but they had her uh, kind of stand in here. And then Bill Mooney just did the voiceover for it. But it's pretty wild. There's a scene where the camera pans to the right and you can see all this lightning going off but you can actually see the shadow of the camera right here and then you'll see uh, the person pushing the dolly right in here and you can see it right there in particular you can really see the whole rig in this scene the antimatter john and the uh, robot and will are walking along these this little trail of trees and they end up having kind of a long speaking part and what happens is they get to the end of this this segment of the set and then they go back and then they had the actors you know go back to the beginning of this trail and then they keep walking the same section over and over and you can really tell because of that tree that's right over here it's got that distinctive bend to it right there you'll see that tree go by about five times they had to do this five or six times uh, when they were doing this scene and they just keep walking down this same scene over and over it's pretty weird the stunt robot makes another appearance in this episode and you can tell uh, that when the robot talks, it's just a light behind these tubes. That's not real neon. It's just those uh, clear rubber tubes that they probably use in fish tanks and stuff like that. Also, um, apologies for this pause thing being in the way. I had to get a new Blu-ray player in the middle of this, and this one's got this thing in the way. But I'm trying to demonstrate here that the uh, buttons, <laughs> they don't actually have any text on them. If you look at the robot's buttons, he's got all kinds of... Uh, writing on these buttons of things like, you know, detent negative, detent positive, alpha, you know, and beta, gamma, stuff like that. But on the stunt one, it's just, they're just plain. Now, this is the second and the last time that we actually get to see the hero robot and the stunt robot together in the same scene. And so the robot is talking to the stunt robot in the cage there, and uh, the stunt robot is the antimatter one. He's now painted black and white. But what's odd is um, during the fight scene, there was a torch left on the ground, and you can see it down here. And as this whole conversation goes on with these two, this torch is scorching and burning the side of the, uh, the robot's tread section. You can see how it's just kind of burning it. And it kind of goes on for quite a while, and it's, uh, I'm actually amazed that it didn't set it on fire. And by the time the robot pulls away, you can actually see that the side panel was scorched. And I think the side panels were made of plastic, so I'm really surprised it didn't melt it. In fact, during the uh, commentary for this episode, I think one of the uh, one of the actors mentioned it about how that was how the side of the robot was being burned like that. This episode is called Princess of Space, and it's in this episode that we start seeing this distinctive square little mark on the robot right there. See that? So now that actually occurred during the filming of the Time Merchant. Uh, the Time Merchant. Actually, uh, I can't remember what he does, but he does something where there's an explosion on the robot right there. That's where the charge was put on there, the squib. And it ended up kind of scorching that part. And for whatever reason, they never cleaned it up. And so in several episodes, you see that there, which means that this episode was filmed before The Time Merchant, even though The Time Merchant aired after that. So that just goes to show you how out of order a lot of these episodes were filmed versus the way they were aired on TV. 
in this scene, the robot is drumming on the drums, and uh, they push him a little bit too far forward, and he bumps into Jonathan Harris right here. And you'll see his reaction right there, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Uh, now, another thing to mention about this episode, uh, once again, June Lockhart and John, uh, um, uh, Guy Williams are nowhere to be seen in this episode. And that is because, once again, they were written out of this episode, just like the one prior. And that goes back to the Great Vegetable Rebellion, which we will discuss when we get to that episode. This episode is called The Time Merchant. And I really like this episode because um, Dr. Smith, the robot, and even Will, for a brief time, actually make it back to Earth. And it's really cool. Now, I just wanted to show this little bit right here. If you look at the robot's arms, see all these little scrape marks right here? And the reason those are there is because, um, now you can't really see it in this, this scene right here, but up here uh, the, where the armhole is for the robot, there's a pin that sticks out. And then there's another one down here at the bottom. And those pins are there so that when Bob pulls the arms in, they lock in on this little hook. See that little hook right there? And so the pin fits into that hook, and that's what keeps the robot's arms in place. Well, every time Bob pulls the arms out, those, that top pin is scraping along the rubber of the arm, and it's been leaving those marks on there. And so those are probably uh, painted rubber, and the paint's actually starting to come off. Just, but just a little you know, thing to note on there. I thought that was kind of interesting. At this point in the series, there was discussion about giving the robot an actual name for a change, because they up to this point, they've only just called him Robot. Now, if you look at this signage over here, that's the robot's crate. That was the crate the robot was in before the Jupiter-2 actually launched. And you can see the signage here says, One General Utility Non-Theorizing Environmental Robot. And you'll notice how the uh, first letter in every one of these is highlighted so that it says Gunter. So I think the, the, um, they were thinking about naming the robot Gunter, I think is what they were going to name him, and it would stand for that which I thought was kind of interesting, and it could really tell me since they highlighted the uh, first letters there in red. Now, this is the scene where the robot has that explosion occur in that little corner on the front of his torso, and that's why we keep seeing that little mark in the corner, like I mentioned earlier, and we'll see that mark, as I mentioned, in several episodes before they finally cleaned it up. It's just kind of weird, but that's where that occurred was in this episode. Another thing to note is... The robot's voice is slightly different in this um, episode. It sounds somewhat tinny. And that's because um, Dick Tufeld mentioned, Dick Tufeld was the, the man who did the voice for the robot. He said that he would go in and do the lines for the robot, but he wasn't always recording on the same machine. And sometimes different machines had different sounds. And it was pretty obvious in this episode that it was a different machine than he normally uses. This episode is called The Promised Planet. And I couldn't find any bloopers in this. And thank goodness, because, oh my gosh, this episode is absolutely horrible. I, <laughs> God, it is so bad. I mean, um, Dr. Smith gets turned into a hippie, and there's just, it's, the, I, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, a sign of the times when this episode was made. But the episode is just absolutely horrible. I think it's the worst episode from the entire series, but we'll just leave it at that. This is the next episode titled Fugitives in Space, and it's a pretty good episode, I, way better than that last one. <laughs> but uh, the actor here is Michael Conrad. Um, those of you who can remember Hill Street Blues, he played the, uh, the police chief, I believe, in that show. Um, but anyway, that's him underneath all this makeup. Now, um, John Chambers was the makeup guy on here. He worked for 20th Century Fox. And you'll notice the similarities to this makeup and the Planet of the Apes, which was being filmed around the same time. And so this makeup is directly taken from the Planet of the Apes. You can see the similarities of it. Now, uh, John Chambers got in trouble for this. He, he, uh, the movie hadn't come out yet for Planet of the Apes, and it was going to be a big surprise to show the makeup and how the, uh, the apes looked in that movie. And then here it is. He goes and uses it on Lost in Space, and this episode came out before the movie did. And so I think he got in big trouble for this. Now, once again, these episodes are filmed out of order. There's an upcoming episode where the robot walks uh, down this narrow section, and there's explosion after explosion, and they're big. And I'll show you when we get to that point in that other episode. But um, he ends up getting really dirty and all this white powder all over him and scorch marks all over. And if you look at his tread section here, see how it's really scorched up and dirty? That was from those special effects that they used in that episode. So that means that episode was filmed before this one. But once again, this episode was 
put on the air before the other one. It's just so weird how their schedules are so mixed up. In fact, I think Jonathan Harris said it would get kind of confusing because there were some times where they would go from one episode getting done filming it and they go right into another one. Or sometimes they were filming two episodes at the same time and he said it would get really confusing. Oh, okay, so my mistake, it was actually this episode that these explosions occur. So here you can see the beginning of it right there at the beginning. So if I do this in slow motion, these explosions are pretty huge. And, you know, thankfully Bob May is uh, inside that costume so he doesn't get hurt. But you can see that these things are, these explosions are absolutely massive. And there's a, several of them. So you can already see that his tread section got scorched just from that one. Here's the next one. <laughs> it's pretty large as well. Speed this up just a little bit. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, they put that, the robot costume through quite a bit in this episode. Here's the next one. And this one actually, uh, if you watch his left tread, it would be our right. You can, all, you can really see a scorch mark right there on this, his left tread. And then this final explosion, <laughs> this is, so there was four of them, and it left this white powder all over him. You'll see him just caked in this white powder. So here you can see all the white powder all over him and the scorch mark on his uh, tread section. He really got scorched pretty bad. I'm really surprised they put that robot costume through so much, uh, you know, punishment when they were filming it because they really only had the one costume besides the stunt one, but in this case, they, they had to use the hero. All right, so here it is, the most famous episode of Lost in Space, The Great Vegetable Rebellion. Uh, this episode needs no introduction. I think just about any Lost in Space fan knows how just infamous this episode is. Now, um, a lot of people don't like this episode. A lot of fans don't like it, but I got to tell you, I, I actually really like this episode. Uh, I mean, there's far worse as far as I'm concerned, but I really like it just because of how absolutely outlandish this episode is. It's just, it's insane how bizarre it is. But anyway, uh, right at the very beginning here, I just wanted to point out now, Bill Moomy, if you notice his eye right here, he's got a really bad sty going on on his eye. And in fact, they had to add in some uh, some words into the script to explain why he had that. Now, Bill Moomy said that he was constantly getting these styes in his eye because of the sand on the set of the planet sets. He said that sand was just filthy and dirty, and he says over the years it got really just nasty. And uh, he said he would always just get these styes because of all the, the dust that would get kicked up from it. And so a lot of times they would have to film him from just one side and profile him. But um, in this case, they just decided to go ahead and... and uh, expose it on here and I think in a previous episode you can kind of still see a little bit of it there so that means that 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 episode was actually filmed after this one. Now this episode is the one that has the infamous carrot man Tybo the carrot man. Now the actor that played this part was uh, Stanley Adams. Uh, you may also know him from Star Trek the original series. He was in the episode The Trouble with Tribbles and so uh, he plays Cyrano Jones in that episode. Now um yeah, I mean, it probably was not easy for him to take this role, and I don't know if he ever was regretting it, but uh, it is definitely an insane costume and an, an insane episode. This is Tybo's assistant, Willoughby, and I can't remember the name of the actor. We'll have to check the uh, credits at the end of this because there's something I want to discuss about that. But I remember this actor because he used to show up in a lot of different shows back then and some commercials as well, but yet another crazy character that was in this episode. Now, this episode is why Guy Williams and June Lockhart weren't in some of the previous episodes, uh, because they got in trouble. This episode was so outlandish, even for them to film, that they couldn't, they couldn't stop laughing. They kept, you know, laughing during the takes, and, and uh, Irwin Allen got really upset with them that they wouldn't take it seriously. And so, as punishment, they were written out of two or three episodes. And in an interview with June Lockhart, she said they were at full salary. They still got paid for it, even though they weren't in those episodes. Now here you can see <laughs> Guy Williams has got a, a smile on his face and he's trying not to laugh because every time they would whack at these weeds with those machetes, um, the, the weeds make this, oh, noise. And <laughs> June Lockhart said there was these people off stage that were making the, the moaning and groaning sounds, um, you know, to imitate what they're going to put in later for the weeds. And she said it was just making them all laugh. It was crazy. 
And here you can see also that June Lockhart is trying not to laugh when she looks up at Guy Williams. But thankfully in this take, they didn't let, you know, the laughter take over. In this scene, that they get this net dumped on them. And June Lockhart said that this net was so dirty and dusty and it was probably used in some old pirate movie. And here they dumped it on them. But uh, now watch June Lockhart's shoulders. She's right here in the, in the purple. You can see her right here. You'll see her uh, shoulders kind of shrug a couple of times where she's laughing. Right there. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. So every time she looked up at Guy Williams, I think it was hard for her to keep a serious face. I think those two just thought the whole thing was absolutely outlandish. Um, Jonathan Harris in a in a uh, interview talked about how uh, the Peter Packer was their writer, and I guess he was one of their best writers. And he comes up to uh, Jonathan Harris with the script behind his back. And so Jonathan Harris was suspicious. And when he hands him the script, um, Jonathan Harris is looking through it. And he goes, are we seriously going to do this? And uh, Peter Packer says, I don't have another idea in my head. I mean, I, the poor guy was running out of ideas. And I think this is the second or the last episode for, of the third season anyway. So <laughs> the poor guy, I think he just ran out of any kind of ideas whatsoever. In this scene, June Lockhart was talking about uh, another th incident that happened during this uh, time when they were filming it. Now, <laughs> this trapdoor, John and Don go down into this trapdoor, down into the basement, but there's actually no basement there. So what happens is when they lift the door, John and Don go behind the door, but they're actually crawling off to the side. So down here where these weeds are, once they get out of view, they're crawling this way. Well, June Lockhart has to sit there and watch that. And she just could not stop laughing about how silly the whole thing was. And they had to do it several times. Now, this is the second time that they have to go down into this um, trap door. Now, watch June Lockhart. Just before they cut, you can see her start to laugh. <laughs> and they, uh, they cut it before they could, uh, you know, catch her. So watch her. See right there? <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. Also, in this episode, um, <laughs> Dr. Smith gets turned into a stock of celery. I mean, oh gosh, it is so crazy. I love this episode. I just love how weird it is. Now here we can see the credits. Now if you look at the bottom, James Milholland was the guy that played uh, Willoughby. Now you'll notice it says James Milholland as Willoughby the Llama. And <laughs> so what happened with that is originally the character of Willoughby was going to be a llama, an actual llama. And I think they were going to make that become a regular character on the show. They wanted to add a real llama to the show. But um, after some several uh, test footages or test takes, uh, Jonathan Harris absolutely refused to work with the llama. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that he had a good reason. I, I think llamas would be difficult to work with. They tend to spit and stuff like that. And I, I think he drew the line with it. So uh, I thought it was interesting. But for whatever reason, they forgot to... Uh, change the credits. Maybe they already made it by that time and uh, it, they couldn't go back and change it before they decided to change the character of Willoughby to a human character. But it's very interesting. I would absolutely love to see the bloopers from this episode or all the bloopers from the, all the episodes. I'm sure they had them somewhere. I was really hoping they would include some of those on this Blu-ray uh, box set. They have some interesting behind the scenes um, uh, special effects footage and blooper footage from different things and those are interesting and I think you can probably find them on YouTube here or uh, online somewhere but I really wish they would have included the bloopers I, I don't know if they still exist maybe they couldn't find them or uh, you know who knows and so I mean we may never see it unfortunately this episode is titled Junkyard in Space it's the last episode for season three and unfortunately the last episode of the entire series now, um, I just wanted to show you, they got such a huge close-up on the robot's collar right in here. Now, if you watch closely, you'll be able to see the shadow of Bob May's head in there. So just kind of watch right in there. See it? You can just kind of see him moving around in there. It's pretty cool, and I don't think I've ever seen where you can actually see inside there, but just the way the light is coming in, when the bubble goes down, you can see Bob May's head, or at least the shadow of it. So when the robot goes down to the planet, he gets stuck in this magnet and he's hanging upside down. Now they obviously used the stunt robot for this, but now if I zoom in on here, see how there's this panel on the robot's uh, uh, torso right here on the back? I have never understood why that panel is there because if you look at the stunt robot on all the previous episodes, there is no hole cut into there. There's no panel or anything. So I really don't know why they have that. So it there's 
been speculation with different people that I've talked to that maybe there was more than one stunt robot, but I don't think there was. I think there was only one stunt. Um, it's quite possible there was more than one torso, though, and that might be what's going on there. It's possible that um, in all the other episodes, we always see how wrinkled up the whole torso is around here, and you can still see a little bit of it on there. Maybe if it is made of paper or whatever it is, or some kind of really flimsy material, it's possible it, it ripped there, and they just patched it to cover up the rip. I really don't know, but then again... Um, I've seen the uh, the stunt robot, I think, now resides at the Mopop Museum in uh, Seattle, Washington. And uh, Fred, let's see, Fred Barton, he's the one that makes full-size replicas of Robbie. He's, he's known as the Robot Man. He got to, um, once the stunt robot here was sold for something like $300,000 at auction, it's insane, uh, he was called upon by the person who bought it, and I think it was Paul Allen, I'm not really sure, to uh, repair it and get it back up and running, or at least get it to look nice, because it had been through quite a bit. And um, nowhere on there did I see that there was this patch. There was no patch on there. So I'm still puzzled by this. I really don't know what's going on here. You can also see one of the ribs, or a couple of the ribs are missing from that vent. But to this day, I'm still mystified by that panel and why it only shows up in this episode and what the deal was about that. When the crew of the Jupiter 2 comes down to the planet to come save the robot, they're walking along all this junk that's down here, and once again we see an array of reused props all over the place. Now, uh, this cylinder that's on this cabinet right here, this computer cabinet, you can see it right there, uh, it's going to start, it's going to roll down and it startles, startles them, and you can see, the, plainly see the wire right here that they use to make it fall. So somebody off camera yanks on it and it, you can, you'll watch it fall right here right there. <laughs> I also noticed in this episode that the robot has this scuff or a scratch right here on his bubble. See that? And there was no part in the episode where that occurs, so it must have been just an accident. Maybe somebody accidentally scraped it right there. It could be just a mark because uh, maybe it was something they could clean off. The robot gets really scorched up in this episode because he put himself in the oven. And you can see they did quite the paint job on him. I think... Um, after the show, the robot was on display at SeaWorld or Ocean World or something like that, and I think somebody said he still had these scorch marks on him, which I find interesting because uh, eventually the costume turned up and it, it must have been repainted somewhere along the line. But anyway, here you can kind of see um, the red ear spinner. It actually spins again in this episode very briefly. So it's kind of cool that uh, they do use it again. Once again in this episode, Guy Williams is hardly even seen in this episode, and I don't think June Lockhart was in it at all, or very little. But then again, June Lockhart by this time was doing uh, Petticoat Junction at the same time, so it's not like she didn't have any other work. I think she was working probably more on Petticoat Junction than this one, uh, mainly because she just wasn't getting much to do on this show, and maybe she knew it was the end? I don't really know. You'll also notice that on the robot's yellow ear right here, there's a piece of black electrical tape on there, and I'm not really sure what the purpose of that was. I'm thinking they only wanted the red sensor to turn, and the motors probably turned both, so maybe they taped it to make sure that that one doesn't turn for some reason. I don't know, it's really weird. I mean, it's pretty obvious there's a piece of tape on there. So there we go. That covers Season 3 and the entire series of Lost in Space with all the bloopers, trivia, and other strange oddities on the show. Um, you know, this show is supposed to have a fourth season, and uh, for those of you who uh, are fans of the show, you probably already know this, but they were going to have a fourth season, and they told everybody, you know, what it was time, you know, when they went on their break after the show was done filming for the third season, they said, hey, okay, we'll see you all back in the uh, fall when we go back to filming, and everybody was expecting to come back, but unfortunately the show was canceled, and nobody was, they didn't get to have a wrap party, they didn't get to say goodbye to each other. And supposedly there's two different stories that I keep hearing as to why the show didn't come back. Um, number one is that they wanted to cut the budget for season four and Erwin Allen absolutely refused to cut the budget anymore. Plus the fact that the actors would probably all get raises um, every time a new season starts. And so he just didn't want to cut the budget. And he said, look, if you guys aren't going to give me the budget I want, I'll just end the show. And then that's exactly what he did. The other theory or the other rumor I heard is that um, one of the executives at 20th Century Fox uh, really loved the TV show Gunsmoke and um, she did not want to see it get canceled because it was supposed to get canceled. And so in order to keep it on for another season, something else had to go. And unfortunately, 
Lost in Space was one of the casualties. Although Lost in Space, they said, was still doing really well in the rating. So I kind of find that strange and odd. But, uh, you know, who knows what the real story was. It would have been really cool to see a season four of this show and uh, see the other crazy things that would have happened. It seems like the show kind of progressed each season. Uh, most people's favorite uh, season of the show was season one, and I can understand that because it was definitely more serious. It didn't get all campy. I think the second season definitely got probably the campiest. The third season did have some pretty campy episodes. I mean, that Great Vegetable Re Rebellion episode being the main one, but I still think the third season had some really cool episodes, and it's still my favorite. And also, I just like the way the uh, the characters had evolved by that time. But anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this series, and um, maybe learned a thing or two or saw some bloopers that you never noticed before. And now you can go back and watch the show and see them for yourself. But uh, anyway, uh, I thank you all very much for watching and I will see you on the next episode. So thanks again and have a good one.